Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming over, and thanks for your interest in this uh, very wonderful topic around uh, cloud analytics, and specifically the case study that we are going to talk about in public health. But before that, uh, you know, let me give you my quick introduction, and then I'll hand it over to Mark as well for his introduction. So as uh, Simon mentioned, my name is uh, Uday Kathira, Managing Director with uh, Deloitte Consulting, and been in the industry for a little over two decades. Uh, what I've grown up uh, in my career is uh, with a focus on all things uh, data, analytics, uh, cognitive automation, and AI topics. I've done this across uh, several different industries and sectors, but for the last uh, five plus years, been focused predominantly around serving um, government clients and empowering them to make uh, data-driven decisions uh, using, using the power of uh, analytics. So very excited to be here. Uh, the story that we're going to talk about today is uh, a very impactful story that uh, you know, we've delivered over the last uh, two, two and a half years uh, through the course of pandemic uh, in the public health uh, domain. Um, I'm, I'm sure you all uh, uh, you know, would uh, find that very valuable so, uh, as, as we found this, uh, delivering this tremendous impact and uh, you would have some good takeaways. So with that, uh, Mark. Thank you, Uday. Um, I'm Mark Kachansky. I am the account manager for the state of Texas at Snowflake. I've uh, been supporting uh, this project over the course of the last two years, but also supporting the account over the last eight. Um, I think it's kind of funny that we have a solution architecture slide, and I've uh, been their account representative for three of the technologies on that solution architecture. <laughs> so I, uh, they, they are not afraid to reach me morning, noon, and night. So uh, have an interesting vantage point on that and looking forward to telling you about the project. And, I don't know if we mentioned, obviously, want this to be interactive. If folks have questions, we obviously have a spot for it at the end. But if you are curious about a slide, don't hesitate to ask. Well, uh, on that note, I think in the next 50 minutes, Mark, we have about 200 slides to cover. <laughs> and it's going to be dead by PowerPoint. But uh, jokes aside, I think uh, absolutely, uh, you know, we want to make this a very interactive session. So feel free to ask questions uh, as we go along the journey. We don't necessarily have to wait till the end, uh, because we want to make sure that if there are questions along the way, they get answered uh, right away. Right, so with that, uh, um, moving along, in terms of what we want to talk about, right, so we're going to talk about uh, what the story is, uh, what the background is with this particular client. It's the public health agency within the state of Texas. So we'll talk about some of the challenges, the problems uh, that they faced uh, as they were kind of getting ready uh, to respond to the pandemic outbreak uh, uh, early 2020 and some of the challenges that they faced and, and how uh, the vision that they long had prior to pandemic, how that was put on steroids and how we kind of all rallied together to deliver a very impactful solution. So we we'll talk about that background. Uh, then we would talk about uh, the approach uh, that we took to solutioning. Uh, as you could imagine, uh, during, during pandemic, everything was an emergency, and especially for a public health agency. So how uh, we took an approach that could give them uh, quick wins, uh, it could get them to the output uh, you know, without necessarily waiting for uh, long cycles of big bang implementations, so, uh, and what were some of the drivers around uh, that and some of the success factors as part of that. So we talk about all of that. Um, we'd also cover our, our journey so far, what started with uh, a simple use case uh, around getting the COVID-related information and data in place uh, in order for us to do analytics, uh, how that uh, you know, simple starting point has transformed now into something what we call it as uh, SHARP, which is the entire state health uh, analytics and reporting platform. So how powerful that has become and what are the different use cases that, has, uh, that have evolved uh, uh, since uh, since our humble beginning, so we'll talk about that as well. And then finally, uh, the impact and the benefits uh, that our, our client stakeholders uh, have been realizing all along the journey and what's, what's uh, up next uh, in this journey. So that's kind of um, what we're going to spend uh, time on. Uh, it's it's going to be... Uh, you know, very few uh, slides to read. It's, it's more about the storytelling. Uh, so as I mentioned, if there are questions, uh, feel free to uh, bring that up as we go along. All right, uh, so with that, the, so very much in the beginning of 2020 when uh, you know, the entire country was uh, getting ready to respond to the outbreak uh, with the COVID, right? Some of the things uh, that were very pertinent uh, for almost every state and, and uh, Texas being as, as large as uh, it is, uh, some of the big things uh, that were uh, on the minds of the state leadership, on the minds of uh, public health uh, leadership there, was to how do we get the handle 
uh, in terms of all the data sets that are out there, right? Uh, if you could think about it, uh, some of the terms like positivity rate and how the R value is moving, some of those terms were not even uh, known to anybody prior to pandemic, and suddenly uh, the states and the agencies were kind of grappling to, to, uh, to understand, hey, what does this all mean uh, for my state, for my jurisdiction, and how all of that uh, can be used to actually make the difference uh, in, in terms of how they ma manage the outbreak whether it's to kind of provide some intermediate uh, interventions in the areas where there is a high vulnerable population mm -hmm. and they don't have access to testing sites, or how do they make decisions in terms of where to funnel all the supplies uh, that uh, you know, were scarce in the beginning, how to make all of those decisions. And for making those decisions, uh, having data is incredibly valuable and getting the right data at the right time with the right quality was the biggest challenge uh, that uh, they were grappling with because some of the systems, um, terms like disease surveillance systems, which is essentially the systems where all the electronic lab records are tracked, all the positive cases, negative cases are tracked, the disease surveillance systems, the systems that track hospitalizations, the systems that track fatalities, the systems that track uh, all things around uh, when the immunization came in, uh, who is getting administered and how is getting administered, how the vaccines are getting allocated, how the providers are doing with respect to administering of the, all of that. All of those data sets were lying in disparate different systems. How do you get all of that together and get it in a manner that is uh, you know, kind of harmonized in a manner that is now yielding the output, it's yielding the insights uh, that's valuable for making the decisions. So that, those are some of the things that we started with. And uh, as, as we started putting together the solutions, there were some of the key objectives or the, uh, the success factors uh, that were kind of our North Stars, so to speak. Some of them were we wanted to make sure that the quality of data is paramount because if the decisions are made based on the information which is not reliable, guess what's going to happen to the interventions that the public health agency is going to do in various jurisdictions, right? How are we going to impact the lives of vulnerables when the information that is uh, you know, being used for making those decisions, it's not reliable. So that was the first North Star that we had. The second was we, uh, our, our whole thing was kind of uh, in the light of emergency, right? Everything was required as of yesterday. Every evening, we'll get a call from state leadership, hey, you know what, uh, we need to do this, uh, and guess what, you need uh, to finish this by tomorrow morning. So we needed to make sure that whatever our solution uh, was doing, uh, it was doing things in the most efficient manner. So we needed to make sure that there was as much automation as possible all the way from ingesting the data, the quality, data quality remediation, producing the analytics. So automation was at the heart and center of the overall solution. The third part was to make it self-service, right? For the epidemiologist, for the scientist community that was relying on this data to come up with the recommendations for the state health leadership because those epidemiologists are all uh, PhDs and data scientists, and they needed a platform wherein uh, they don't have to worry about the data piece, so that uh, you know, all of that is reliable enough so that they can then focus on generating real insights and providing the recommendations to make uh, decisions. So we needed to make that self-service, that was the thing. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key goals was to, while use this emergency and the, the solution that we put together was primarily a foundation to address that immediate problem, but real goal was to modernize how the state public health uh, agency works in terms of using the data as, as a part of their day-to-day -day, uh, decision-making process. So that's kind of the overall backdrop uh, with which uh, you know, we started. If I can add yeah. a few things on that. I think it's important, too, to think about the fact that the people that were consuming this data were varying skill sets and varying roles, right? Some of these things were flowing up all the way to the governor's office where they were making policy decisions for statewide, things like reopening and... Uh, you know, it was more than just public health stakeholders, right? There was also some of this data that was going to flow out to the public, to to the public, to the, the citizens of Texas, to try to understand the the depth and magnitude and hot spotting from a location perspective across the state. Uh, the other thing that you hit on, I I, I don't want to double down on. The data sources were crazy. They were some of them were like really new. Like we had 
contact tracing was the new right. cloud application that came online directly in response. But then there was also, you know, even some data sources that were like legacy mainframe applications. So this was taking data from the entire gambit from like brand new modern application to legacy and try to put it all in one platform. So it was, that was a interesting takeaway, I guess. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. It, I think as we talk about this, it, it gives me like a you know very quick walk down the memory lane in terms of what, what we have done in the last two, two and a half years and how far we have come along. So all right, so we coined this term called SHARP. What is SHARP? SHARP stands for a State Health Analytics and Reporting Platform. As I was mentioning, uh, while we started with the COVID analytics and the COVID specific use case, the real goal was to use uh, this platform as a platform that is robust enough, scalable enough, uh, and that's it's something that can be used for all the use cases within the entire realm of uh, state health. So that's, that's why the nomenclature of uh, state health analytics and reporting platform. Now what are some of the, uh, the key tenets of uh, the solution that we have put together? So first thing, uh, we needed, given the type of data that we were handling, right? We were handling PII information, PHI information, uh, all the test results, positive, negative, fatalities. So you can imagine the criticality of this data was paramount. And because that was uh, so paramount, we needed to make sure that the environment is uh, solid from the security perspective, from the data privacy controls perspective, and, and the key uh, premise was that nobody should have access to anything unless they are authorized to see it, unless they have a need to see it. So the security part and, and the entire thing uh, around the cloud management was the topmost priority. And, and why cloud? Uh, obviously, we needed to uh, produce the output uh, very, very quickly. So the, the cloud was the only answer uh, to go with. So that was the first part. The second part was scalable. We started very quickly, right, uh, from uh, day one on the project uh, to the first production rollout. It was a matter of four weeks. And think of it in the legacy world where we deal with the on-premise systems. There's no way you, you can kind of get to that, right? We can't even uh, provision the servers and the infrastructure in the matter of four weeks, the rest alone going to production in four weeks. So one of the key things was to make sure that we are approaching things in a scalable manner. Uh, when we started, we were dealing with very little data. Now the data we're talking about is, is like to the hundreds of GBs uh, of the data that we were, we've been able to scale in the matter of uh, you know, a short period of time. So scalability was the other uh, big aspect around that. Uh, the aspect around uh, policies, uh, data poli privacy policies, uh, access policies, all of that uh, clearly defined ownership structures because uh, in any um, environment, the folks that are responsible for, let's say, hospitalization information are probably not uh, you know, privy to the information that is coming from the lab records or the information that's out there for fatalities is not accessible uh, to the folks that are responsible for doing immunization, for example, right? Because all of this is so sensitive information. So who has uh, access to what? Uh, who has uh, rights to take what actions on data? All of that had to be very tightly governed. And all of this was put, put together ground up, right? So the whole data governance uh, structure uh, was very vital to make sure that you know, all of those policies are kind of agreed upon and, uh, and the stakeholders were defined in terms of who would make decisions at the data steward level, who would make decision at the overall leadership level, who would be the decision to say, yeah, we, we are able to change this data into this something else, right? So that whole governance structure was, was the key part of it. So that was uh, the other key aspect of SHARP. Then uh, given the number of stakeholders that were involved, making sure that everybody has the same definition so I, I, my favorite example here is the positivity rate, right? If, if you were tracking uh, you know, the media around uh, the course of pandemic, there were so many different definitions of how a positivity rate is calculated. There was no standardization around that. Everybody, every media outlet would have their way to do it. Every uh, you know, uh, agency would have its own way of doing it. So how do we make sure that uh, what we are doing, at least within this agency, everybody has the same definition? So coming up with the data taxonomy, having the glossary defined, having all of uh, the nomenclature, uh, the calculations, all of those uh, getting it uh, in a standard manner, 
getting it documented and making it available to all the uh, all the players all the way from day-to-day uh, -day, uh, you know the data analysts to the epidemiologists to the leadership so that everybody looks at uh, the same thing and has the same outcome in terms of what they can expect with that so how do we put that together uh, was another key facet of it and the lineage right when you change the data it's very important to know what drove the change and and where the change happened so the lineage portion all the way from the source systems that were disease surveillance systems or contact tracing systems or immunization systems uh, getting the data from there to the analytics platform and what transformation it goes along the in, along in the journey and uh, capturing all of that through the lineage was another important aspect of it and then finally, the icing on the cake with respect to getting this to, in the hands of a decision maker to the visualization and analytics uh, was the other key component in terms of how easily we do that, how we do it in a manner that is uh, easily consumable, uh, easily understandable, and, and getting the right data at the right time to the right people uh, was the other key part, aspect of it. So th these were the five key tenets uh, of, of the solution that we had put together. Mark, anything you would like to uh, double down on? Yeah, I, I think you know this. This was uh, this was a, a new one for for Snowflake, and and uh, working really closely with some of the other technology vendors that supported this project was really important. Um, you know, AWS being a, one of the big ones of that. Uh, this was actually one of the first deployments for Snowflake to go into the AWS Gov Cloud, so that's been. Uh, a, a learning curve, but obviously, you know, highlights the need of the sensitivity of this information, and and you know, we're using the the role-based access and governance controls to make sure, like you said, only the people who are supposed to have the appropriate degree of access has been a really key point. Um, that also maps to some new legislation, new new uh, required. Uh, uh, data governance rules in the state of Texas that we had to be conscious of that were thrown at us in flight. So uh, big props to the team uh, on the Deloitte side for being able to manage that. That was that, uh, required some, some uh, new understanding of, of data governance policies and procedures that, that were introduced in the middle of the project. Yep. And, and with uh, <clears throat> so many firsts, right? First uh, Snowflake implementation in the state and local area, the first uh, implementation on Gov Cloud with Snowflake, uh, with the Snowflake Gov Cloud in it, uh, with a lot of ETL tools, a lot of visualization tools, a lot of advanced analytics tools all coming together and working in harmony. It pretty much felt like that we were uh, building the plane while we were flying it. <laughs> And uh, in order to do that, <laughs> what approach did we take, right? Uh, is, is there any right approach uh, to build the plane while you're flying it? Probably not, but this was our method to the madness here. <laughs> it, it worked, uh, yeah, very proud of that, uh, certainly. So what you see here is a spaghetti ball to the left is basically a you know, simple representation of evolving requirements, right? It's not that we had a COVID-related pandemic before. There were no playbooks written. Nobody had any idea in terms of how to react to that and react to in a manner that is efficient enough, effective enough, uh, and all of that. So our approach was to go agile, right? We were literally running two-week sprints, and I think I mentioned earlier that uh, our, our day one to first production go live was in the matter of four weeks, which means two sprints in, and we were into production. And in order to do that, the only way to uh, go is not let perfection be the enemy of speed, right? Yeah, we knew that there would be things that would change because that was the, the nature of pandemic, right? Things were changing on a daily basis. We were kind of reacting to it. So if we wait to get every, all the requirements sorted out up front and then do perfect design, perfect architecture, and go, you know, a poster child implementation, probably we did not have time for that, right? Because that's not what our stakeholders were expecting. So our approach was to go fully agile, right? Do in the iteration of two weeks, take a piece of requirement, go implement it, and then uh, move on to the next one. If there are changes, take it on the next sprint, right? And we did this in a very much an incremental fashion, right? We did not go with all the data sets in first. We started with the most important data set back then in March of 2020, when we are in probably late spring, early summer of 2020, 
our initial focus was the case information because at that time the cases were increasing like crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So get the labs records in, get the uh, case records in, start processing that, start generating insights of that, start producing the initial version of positivity rates, start producing the output, okay, hey, in this county, in this jurisdiction, you know, there is this issue that is being detected based on the trends. Uh, so send additional testing sites there, or, or send mobile sites, or send additional uh, you know, facial masks, or any other PPEs, or whatever that, uh, decisions that were needed to be taken. Do all of that, and then start iterating on that. As new data sets come available, uh, start adding more. So then we added uh, hospitalization, fatalities, uh, then we added uh, contact tracing, we added uh, immunization records as they came in, right? And we just kept on increasing the scope in an incremental fashion. And uh, to us, uh, you know, that was probably the only way we could have delivered some meaningful output. So, so I think uh, very, very proud of this approach. If I do the retrospection two years uh, in the memory lane here, because we were able to produce output very, very quickly, right? Uh, and in the analytics world, if there are no quick wins, you lose interest very quickly. So, so this was the one that really helped us uh, quite, quite well. And uh, <clears throat> obviously, along with that, uh, we needed to make sure the solution is secure and reliable. So we had the whole governance pro program around it uh, to make sure that we define the data governance rules. Uh, we define uh, the stakeholders. We have the, all the right approval processes. We even had ATO, right, which is the authority to operate. So which means that we went through the full-on uh, life cycle of security assessment, vulnerability testing, privacy assessments, all of that, before we were ATO'd on this one. And we did that while we were kind of building the solution. So that was other, other uh, big, big focus in the, and the, the last piece I would highlight here is the interoperability. We were dealing with so many different systems, right? I talked about disease surveillance, contact tracing, immunization. All of these in the public health world are its own legacy systems. So we needed a solution that could very quickly connect to all of that, right? We did not have time to build manual interfaces and all that. So we needed connectors, and, and that's where our, our, and you'll see that in architecture in a moment, uh, in terms of the technologies that we used to get that going fairly quickly because we needed an interoperable system. We needed a system that is uh, you know, accessible uh, and uh, that can work really quickly in a responsive manner. Right. Anything on this one uh, that you would like to add, Mark? Uh, yeah, no, I think you hit it great. The, the main thing I'll say is he's not exaggerating when he says the requirements were changing in flight. Uh, new terminology was introduced. I mean, if y'all, uh, it was obviously, you know, it's a year and change in the past now, but um, some of the terms that were thrown at us we had never heard <laughs> prior to having to have a standard definition for them, and, and that was happening in flight and new requirements coming in seemingly overnight with... Classic example, positivity rate. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Who knew here yeah, that there was a thing called positivity rate? Or that there was like 40 different definitions for it, so, <laughs> yeah. So, all right, so that's on the approach, right? So now, uh, solution architecture, what brought it all together, right? So this was the best of the breed in terms of for different purposes. Uh, so all of this at the backbone, uh, from the solution architecture perspective, some of the key components, uh, AWS, uh, Snowflake on AWS was the, the big component of it. There are a lot of native services of AWS that we were using for near real time. And, and I'll walk through this architecture in a moment, but uh, some of the native services are the AWS. Informatica was a big portion of it for all the ETL work, right? So all the batch processing, all the data quality remediation, all the data governance, uh, all of that was Informatica. On the visual and the visualization side, it was predominantly Tableau. And then we had integration with uh, ArcGIS for all the geospatial aspects of it, SAS for all the advanced analytics. And then um, as, as we have progressed, now we also have the downstream uh, with respect to the APIs and uh, Snowflake reader accounts and all of that uh, going out, right? So from the process perspective, right, walking from um, left to right, uh, on the left side, what you see here are all the different uh, you know, systems. Now, obviously, we haven't listed all the uh, specific systems, but these are the types of systems, right? So we had a CRM application on Salesforce. We had a bunch of legacy databases that I was just referencing with uh, disease surveillance and uh, immunization and all that. We had a lot of files coming in from hospitals and fatalities information. 
And then there were a lot of this end user applications too. Like for example, there were a lot of uh, bespoke solutions uh, where different um, agencies or department of energy, uh, emergency management, they had put together uh, to kind of run the show. So we were getting data from there as well so as to make sure that you know, this becomes the holy grail and is, is one place for all the reliable information. So a bunch of different data sources. Uh, we had multiple different types of pipelines going in. We had uh, batch pipelines that were happening over on the nightly basis. We had near real time happening uh, through AWS and Lambda and all of that. Uh, near real time for the data that needed refresh like every hour kind of thing. So we had that as well uh, in, in place. And once we ingested all the data, it went through the full on uh, data processing uh, with respect to getting the data curated, getting the data uh, remediated for all the data quality issues, whether it's the standardization or whether it's a cleansing. All those routines were put in place, right? Even deduplication. Because think of it this way, right? If uh, case information, if as a, as a patient, I'm going and getting tested in three different labs to make sure that I'm really positive or not, right? I am still, and that all happens in the span of two days, I'm still actually a single positive case. I'm not three different positive cases because I went and tested in three, in three different labs. So how do we make sure that all of that information is deduplicated and uh, you know, the right information is available for decision making? So uh, master data management and deduplication was, was a key tenant of, of that part. And once all of that is done, uh, finally the data would uh, sit in our curated layer, which is basically the data which is used for all the downstream analytics. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we also had various uh, specific subject, specific MARDs, because as I mentioned, right, uh, different uh, stakeholders, different APs or epidemiologists would have access to only their specific data sets. So we get everything in the curated layer and then uh, create the specific marts for the specific stakeholders so that they can have uh, the information that they need to run their day-to-day -day, uh, business. Right? And all of that uh, insights uh, from the consumption perspective was using all of these uh, tools uh, that you see here. Right? And the stakeholders were uh, epidemiologists, the leadership, uh, the data analysts, uh, and now uh, as, as we've kind of uh, moved along, and we'll talk about that in, in the journey that we've kind of traversed through, now we've given access to the local departments as well, so local health authorities, uh, and that's a big win as well, because um, up until this point, there was no synchronized form of uh, incised delivery mm -hmm. to, between the local, ex, uh, local units and the central unit. So now this has uh, paved the way for that as well because everybody is now working off the same set of information. So, so that's kind of the architecture. And obviously, I, I talked about the governance components uh, from Informatica as well as the power, power uh, center part for the batch processing. Anything to yeah, call out so on? Yeah, I, I think from a, a solution archi architecture perspective, one of the things that really steered this to the cloud was the fact that uh, there were so many different consumers, right? You're building that single repository, single source of truth, but then you're effectively needing to federate out, hey, the, the, these users are only able to see X, Y, or Z in the sort of an on-prem model that never could have yeah. worked, right? Because you'd be making extracts of files and moving it to a different infrastructure for each different line of business or different use case. So what you were describing there about being able to effectively design data marts for each different use case, for each different user group that had separate uh, permissions for what they could view. That's all done logically. It's not, you know, you're not making a separate copy of the data truly. You're not uh, extracting, extracting that and taking it and putting it in its own, uh, you know, true separate uh, infrastructure or, or separate set of tools. But that's all managed through cloud application uh, in, in, in Snowflake, and then the infrastructure to support that, uh, Snowflake administers a lot of the uh, AWS compute to distribute that for a different use case, right? So if you've got a group of users hitting a Tableau dashboard in one area versus uh, some of the, the epidemiologists that might be looking to use SaaS, uh, they're only seeing the amount of data that they're supposed to, but they have effectively the unlimited performance and scale of the cloud. Anything you'd add there? No, that's, that's great. I'm going to grab that water bottle. <laughs> All right. Cool. Oh, question. The AWS Hive Commons, Lambda, and what's the other one? I'm very in data ingestion. Oh, that's, the, that, that's basically SNS service? SNS. Yeah. 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 Uh, what's the machine learning? They're not going to data to 
Uh, great question. So yeah, so there was the piece uh, done on the machine learning, and that's basically to identify. So think of it this way: the use case that that we were kind of using uh, machine learning for was predominantly around the vulnerability assessment or the risk assessment for individual uh, citizens in various jurisdictions, and uh, we were doing that by combining that with uh, some of the external data sets as well uh, for the socioeconomic impacts, right? And getting that information combined with uh, the information that's locally out there with the public health agency to then identify the risk factor. So for example, if I have certain history with respect to uh, some medical conditions or I have a history with respect to some of my socioeconomic factors that could impact the, uh, the access that I would have with respect to the medical facilities, Applying all of that uh, parameters uh, to kind of come up with a model that would assess my risk score so as to, for the public health agency to know whether I'm vulnerable or not based on my history. And if I'm vulnerable and I don't have access to the medical facilities, they would need to send some intervention for me. So that is the kind of the use case uh, that was uh, you know, used for the... No, through native Python, yeah. A qu quick question here. Yeah. yeah. No, it's on EC2. EC2? Yeah. So the IS service in EC2 connecting to the Snowflake? That's right. And how about the ArcGIS? ArcGIS is also the same. Uh, it's a separate install on its own. Now, ArcGIS is the on-prem version. We don't have the cloud version here because that was a pre-existing setup. So we're just uh, leveraging directly uh, through the firewalls. Yeah. yeah th thanks for sharing. I got two questions. Um, I guess the first one from the connector standpoint, um, you know, you did this pretty quickly. So I'm curious because there's mainframes and other things. What uh, out of the box connectors did you use and, and from which tooling? Yeah, so, so different uh, connectors for different purposes, mostly uh, for bringing the data for the batch ones. This was Informatica's connectors, so we had the Snowflake uh, connectors, we had Salesforce connectors, we had the vSAM connectors uh, through the DB exchange and all of that. So those were the connectors that we'd used for Informatica. For uh, the PubSub and the SNS service, it was basically directly the messaging service connecting uh, through the Salesforce application to bring the data uh, in the near real time. Got it, got it. And, and then for the... Uh... A role level, like the security. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed you guys used a lot of the uh, cloud managed services here. Was there any discussion or evaluation around using something like Previous Era or Muta on top of this? Uh, not really, no. Uh, so our, our native uh, security is both uh, row and column level, mm -hmm. all right? And all of that was uh, it's, it's done directly uh, into the tools itself and within the Snowflake. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Following up on the connector topic, so the consumption side, uh, th there was also some Snowflake native connectors for both uh, Tableau and for SAS that That's came into play for the analytical users to connect into the data source. Yeah, yeah thanks, that, that's a good, good add. And also in terms of, uh, as we, I was talking about, that we are now foraying into sharing this as a public health data sharing initiative, right, which is basically um, providing this information to the local health entities. Now think of it this way, right? Texas has 254 counties and so many local health departments, so they would need the same information. So now they don't need to uh, come up with their own ways of gathering this information or getting this information manually from the central exchange. All of that is uh, through the Snowflake Reader, and we are provisioning uh, those accounts uh, for the LHEs as well. Yeah, we, we are, are using DMS. There are also the, basically through the SNS service, as I was mentioning, we have the mechanism to identify the event based. So we have the events captured, and through those events is when we would be notified, and then that triggers the workflow through the Lambda function and things like that. Okay, uh, good questions there. All right, so how had we structured this, right? Uh, something like this uh, obviously, uh, you know, needs a needs lot more structure to, to kind of get to the efficiency level of output generation that we are looking for. So we had a dedicated focus team around data governance, uh, which was making sure that 
the whole aspects around the ownership of the data, the reliability, security aspects, privacy aspects, all of those were kind of identified. So that was the first big component, and, and that was one of the main drivers of setting all of these things up, right? Because think of it like the amount of variability that we have with respect to the stakeholders and the data sets. If we don't have governance structure in place, uh, it, it would all uh, you know, fall, fall apart. So that was the first uh, piece that we stood up. Then the whole data engineering piece, which is to do with uh, all the data acquisition, getting the, uh, getting the data extracted from these different systems, getting the data through the quality management process, through the curation process. So that was all an engineering team. And then we had uh, focus around analytics, which is basically tasked to work with the EPIs and analysts and the leadership to understand what metrics and KPIs they would want. Uh, and, and basically, based on that, come up with the dashboards, uh, whether it's uh, you know, just the descriptive reports or whether it's uh, predictive reports or any, in some cases, even prescriptive in certain situations with respect to analytics output that was uh, delivered through that. And then the whole uh, underlying infrastructure management uh, team to make sure that all the environments are up and running, the performance is as desirable if we see any sluggishness in the performance, because the volume of data that we were dealing with was huge. Right, so with that kind of volume, in order to make sure that the environments are performing in an optimal manner, so that was another thing. And then the other big factor was this change management, because everybody was coming together for the very first time to solve a particular issue. Right, uh, they all had different backgrounds. They had all different uh, understanding of uh, the data sets that were out there. And certainly nobody had any clue of what these tools and technologies that we're talking about. So in order to drive the adoption, in order to drive uh, the, the synchronization between the different players, the change management, which primarily comprised of user enablement, so user adoption, trainings, all those kind of things uh, was another uh, big focus as well. So that we are bringing everybody along the journey versus saying, hey, we have stood up this uh, glamorous solution, go start using it, right? It doesn't work that way. So the change management was part and parcel of um, what we did as part of the overall solution. I think as an example of that, the um, s some of the epi type of users that were you know, SaaS users for their entire career would, would have historically have been used to working off of their own copy of the data uh, and, and pulling them forward into a highly governed environment with the scalability that we were able to provide for them uh, has shown a, a tremendous value to them, but it was uh, uncomfortable, I think, from an end user perspective for folks that were used to doing it the same way for a long time. So that was, that was probably the biggest piece in adoption was that the change management side. I mean, the technology all worked great, but if you don't get the, uh, the end users to adopt new processes, they're gonna use the, the same old system they always have. Exactly, and even today, right, after two, even after two years, as we keep expanding the scope, we are still having to do a lot of uh, change management because think of it this way, right? I was talking about um, 254 counties uh, and, and certainly their individual jurisdictions within that. Some of the big ones, like for example, the metros like Dallas and Houston and all that, would have their own sophisticated capabilities. They, they would just want, hey, give me the data and we, we take it from there. And then there would be a lot of small ones who would say, hey, we don't know what Snowflake is. We don't know how to use Snowflake Creator account. Uh, you know, you just give us the data that we need uh, in, a, in a flat file or in a spreadsheet so that we can you know, go do our thing that we need to do on a daily basis. So there's so much of variety in terms of uh, the maturity of different users. And we needed to make sure that there is an answer for every type of user and that was out there, right? And in that journey, um, our teaming partners played a big role as well. So Snowflake, as Mark was talking about, right, he's been with us all along this journey, even prior to we started this project. Uh, same thing with Informatica, same thing with AWS, same thing with Tableau, right? All of our, our teaming partners were hand in hand with us uh, to make sure that we all come together uh, to deliver this tremendous impact uh, that's, that's required for the state. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's the goal, right? And that's the path of the journey that we are on now, that, okay, as each state now starts thinking about their modernization effort, 
uh, what, how we can make sure that this becomes a reference architecture and then it becomes a blueprint for everybody's uh, modernization journey. Yeah. yeah. So just a couple questions from, I guess, where you're collecting data from. Are you pulling directly from hospital data sets? Are you pulling from PCPs? Where's that data coming from? And then also in regards to fire standards and governance, how does that in, in play in some of the way public health data is moving in and out of EHRs and EMR systems? Right, so all, all of that, I think from the where we are pulling the data is kind of from all over, right? So providers send, as I was mentioning, right, we receive ELRs from the directly the the labs and the PCPs, right? And they send the uh, HL7 directly. So we had our HL7 pipelines built out uh, to basically understand that so that there's no you know, manual massaging or we need, don't need to transform anything. So we had those HL7 uh, hooks directly into our, uh, into our systems. So that was the first piece. In terms of how do we deal with, uh, you know, with the EHRs directly, so it was, again, uh, our, our focus was to build the standard interoperable uh, interface uh, that everybody can use and, and use to communicate that. So that, that's how essentially that was done. Okay. okay. Um, moving along um, in the journey so far, so as I was mentioning, our, 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 we started with a very narrow focus with respect to getting handled around the COVID data. But as you would see, right, what we started back in the summer of 2020 with just focused on COVID has now become a full-on solution that caters to a lot of different things within the state health, right? So now we don't only have the infectious diseases related to the COVID, but we have other infectious diseases with respect to HIV, TB, other STDs. We have data from other program areas within the state health. Think of it as health statistics. Think of it as health information with related to the healthcare providers and the resources around that, the vital stats. So the scope of this is kind of, you know, is to make sure that now over the course of next one or two years, we bring everything that's out there within the state for state health under this platform so that now this becomes the holy grail for all things the decision making uh, for, for the agency. So that's, that's, the, that's where we are heading towards, right? The other big piece is enabling all the local health entities so that they don't have to run their own data sets, they don't have to do their own thing, right? They can work in tandem with the central public health agency and they work, uh, walk in lock steps and, and the friction that is typically out there is reduced uh, by virtue of just enabling everybody to work from the singular data set and data repository. So that's, that's where uh, we are heading um, in the times to come with respect to the journey. Uh, and I think from a, a governance perspective, um, one of the benefits that we're starting to see is in the legacy means of sharing data, it's immediately stale, right? If you're either sending an SFTP of a file to someone or maybe it's an API-based connection. So trying to keep as many of these different stakeholders that might need different subsets of that information operating against one central governed version of the truth so you're not getting different outcomes from a reporting perspective by having a point in time versus you know, what the state's central version of the truth might be. Um, and that, I guess, applies also to our local health authorities because we're using the live data sharing uh, for them to have access to, to the live data and not a stale copy. Yep. And one little brag point before I move away from this slide is this project did win the coveted uh, Excellent Project Excellence Award last year from the statewide uh, agencies as well. So I think uh, it was well recognized in terms of the impact uh, that this project delivered for the agency. All right, and, and uh, the last one here is in terms of the impact, right? I kept talking about a lot of uh, tremendous impact to what that impact was. Mm -hmm. So impact, first thing, uh, this was the first time that we were able to establish the data source that was reliable, that was kind of curated, that was all available at one place, so that anybody that needed information uh, to take their day-to-day -day actions, it was all out there, right? So the trusted uh, data sources and the governance aspect is the big, big win, uh, which was which was non-existent, so to speak, uh, prior to this initiative. Uh, manual data processing, we don't, we have pretty much everything now automated through the data engineering pipelines that we have. We are now also in the process of doing automated DevOps for all the release management, deployments, everything. 
so that uh, you know there is very manual intervention uh, involved in the entire process. The goal is to make sure that all the stakeholders spend their time in running their public health business without necessarily having to worry about the data and the quality of the data and accumulating the data and all of that, right? So our goal, if there was a singular win to give them, uh, was to give them some time back. And that was achieved uh, through this reduction of the manual data processing that was in place, right? Insights uh, goes without saying, right? Everything uh, that was all the business metrics that were put together on the dash was all the KPIs that were uh, created for any predictive alg algorithms were all uh, based on the business needs. Uh, and it was tuned to ma in a manner that they can directly use that information uh, to make uh, to take actions versus necessarily using it as an FYI information, right? Which is just ret retrospective. Data sharing, another big topic, right? Uh, in terms of uh, how, how have we seamlessly enabled data sharing? Though we are still in the pilot state with some handful of counties, the goal is that in the next year or two, we enable this data sta uh, sharing uh, statewide uh, uh, so that the entire state is connected to the single tissue and the network works, uh, hub and spoke works seamlessly. And then obviously the responsiveness because now the question comes from the state leadership. We don't have to, hey, put five people on work, uh, work uh, day and night to pr produce the information that is being asked by the state leadership. All the answers are available now in the sing single solution and they can just query it or they can run their own dashboard and they get that. So that's kind of uh, the output and the impact uh, that we were able to deliver through this. And, and it's, I don't think it's really just to those external, uh, you know, the, the cities and counties, it's also within the agency itself. So the agency, our, our Health and Human Service Agency operates all of our state health and human service programs and is with a lot of other entities that have some of that federation of like data has to reside uh, or, or retain ownership within its respective program, uh, we're able to share that golden governed version of the truth from the public health perspective uh, that's needed from some of the other, other uh, program areas, right? So we're seeing interest in data that resides within the platform from other parts of, of the agency, not just the public health side. Uh, so hopefully that'll be a future use case for data sharing as well. Right, absolutely, and, and, and that's why we have this line at the bottom here. Uh, our goal is to expand as the needs expand, right? And as, as they start using it, they come up with more and more use cases, and we bring those use cases to life. And that's kind of uh, where we see this going into the future. All right, so with that, I think uh, that's all. Any, any other questions uh, that, yeah? Uh, did you have tools to help make the, with data, did you use tools for the data governance, like um, make the data more discoverable or make the documentation more accessible? Yeah, so uh, so if you noticed on the architecture slide, we had thing called Exxon, Informatica Exxon and EDC. So EDC was used for data lineage purposes and Informatica Exxon, which is a web-based tool, uh, was used for documenting all the taxonomy and the processes and all that. And that was uh, given out to the users to basically do that. And it's role-based, so those who have the permissions to edit and author any of these would have the editing capabilities and others would just have read-only accounts. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Hey, Uday. Uh, yeah, hi. Hey, two questions can you cover? One sure. is on the networking. Like you have so many data sources, both internally coming in and then externally, because of multiple people you're connecting. How is the interconnect, like AWS direct connect, or what is the connectivity, how you are doing? And second one is what you are doing for the disaster recovery. If you can cover those, that will sure. sum it yeah. up. Yeah, so the connectivity is through the direct connect. So we, the state has the full on uh, dedicated line and going to the data center. So that's, that's how the infrastructure pipeline uh, is set up. And, and, and basically, once that is done, the goal is to make sure that it is seamless. So as the new uh, systems come to life, it goes to the same uh, DCS, which is the data center, uh, which is a central location through which the uh, you know, AWS direct connectivity is, is hosted. So that's, the, that's how far that is handled. What is the second question, sorry? DR. Disaster recovery, right? Yeah, so disaster recovery is right now uh, based on uh, so two levels. So there is the whole app level disaster recovery, which is kind of, uh, we've 
we maintain two different layers of redundancy for the application. And then obviously all the infrastructure side is with the AWS itself. So that, that's how that is mentioned. And on the Snowflake side, we actually just implemented uh, or I guess we're in the process since we migrated regions into the AWS GovCloud, we're uh, going to have a failover between different AWS regions for the Snowflake service. Uh, so that we'll replicate the data to the other region, and if uh, GovCloud were to go down, uh, we are, we have another region we can operate off of. Question here? Yep. I, can you um, comment on the amount of uh, human labor required to produce all this? You know, number of contractors, or the, and also the balance of government or state government and contractors. Yeah, so I mean, we had a fairly large team. So as you were, uh, uh, if you noticed on the team structure, we had like five different teams for different aspects. Uh, so we had uh, that team that was from Deloitte uh, helping the state as a systems integrator. And then uh, from the state side, obviously, they had a pretty good representation also across all of these areas to make sure that we work in tandem with them. Now, the goal was that over the course of time, as the solution was established and you know it, it went into production, uh, the involvement from the state side was shifted more from helping with the solution to start using the solution so that they can carry on with their day-to-day -day activities and the insights that they need from the solution. So when, the, when we started the journey, they were part of our engineering team, but by the time we kind of got into steady state, they became the consumers of the, of the solution. So that, that's how uh, the teaming was done. So like all, answer the question? all your BI and analytic users today are state yeah. folks. Twenty people, people. Oh, you mean the numbers? Yeah. yeah. So we had uh, from on, on the SI side, uh, we had about a team of I would say about uh, 30, 35 people, right? And then um, on the on the state side, uh, we had about 15ish. Yeah. I, I was wondering if you guys um, tracked like success stories, in the sense of you know you said what the impact was, but it was more of an let's say. IT impact, but what about like for the governor or whoever? You know, like did did you guys track? Oh, because of this data, we were able we we reached 16 you know different counties that would have been crushed otherwise. That, that, like that's that. right. Yeah. So for for the business or the oh sorry the program stakeholders. Oops. Yeah. Uh, the thing was the two things, right? Actionable insights and increased responsiveness. So I, I kind of quoted that uh, when the state leadership, so basically, uh, you know what I'm talking about from the state leadership perspective, right? So when the office of the governor reaches out for, for a particular piece of information, how fast we are able to turn around is the big key metric. Now, I haven't quoted a percentage here, but that was the big factor for our, our whole success factor thing, right? We had, uh, as we were driving the user adoption, we would have our program stakeholders or the program teammates saying, hey, how their life has become so much better, how their late nights and weekends work have redu has reduced because all of these insights that they need is now readily available. So, so those are some of the, pr from the program perspective, those were some of our key takeaways. I think I can hear you. No, but I, I meant, like, is anybody Yeah, no, we, we do capture that and that gets published in the internal newsletter to the entire um, agency, right? But we don't, we haven't gone out to the public and said, hey, you know, here is the specific benefit that we have accomplished. But yeah, internally it, it does go into their uh, newsletters. So, and there's a dedicated newsletter around this initiative just to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. Yeah, all right. I know we kind of uh, between you and your lunch, but uh, we are here. Uh, if there are more questions, we are happy to answer. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any any last questions? Yeah. Go ahead. No. No. S3 was primarily our. Uh, some, not all sources were directly system sources, right? So many of them were coming through the files like hospitalization data and all that. So that would basically uh, get dropped in S3 and then we'll pick it up from there. So that's where the S3 was. Everything was coming to S3, even your relational and the 
No, not everything. So, for example, all the batch ones would directly go from Informatica to the to the you know a processing layer, or through the AWS Lambda to the processing layer, things like that.